Welcome, everybody, for our last substantive panel before we break up into our roundtable. And uh, unexpectedly, power has devolved to me. But we're going to have a, a really good panel, as we had in the morning on Latin America. So we're going to focus on some of the challenges which are there for sub-Saharan Africa. And we've got a, a really good set of people, including by Skype, if all the technology works, Bob Mattis. And Bob is going to join us from Cape Town. Bob has had a very heavy um, schedule, but he did give his paper in yesterday, so it's fresh and new, and he told me the data ana analysis has just been done. So we're going to start with Bob from Cape Town on popular perceptions of the freeness and fairness from the Afrobarometer, the great source. And then we'll go on to Nicholas Kerr, who again will be using some of these uh, areas, working closely, I believe, with Bob Mike Bratton. Again, Bob and um, Mike have, w have really founded the Afrobarometer and really taken it to great lengths. And then we'll move on to issues of rigging elections in Ghana, a case study. And then we'll move on to issues of a broader comparison of Sudan, Libya, and Jordan. And so let's start then with Bob. And uh, can you hear us, Bob? Are you good? Marvellous. I can hear you beautifully. And you're coming in with your presentation. So, I'm going to engage with, with this data. Uh, and I turn back just to some of Lindbergh's, uh, you know, showed the correlations, but had no really data on why, but had some important speculations on what, why elections seem to be having these positive effects. And he, he focused on a series of organizational issues, for example, election monitoring organizations, then after the election have to find other things to do, and they become involved in, as democracy NGOs, the same kind of arguments with news media. But there are also arguments about individuals, that simply by engaging, by, uh, engaging people uh, in elections, voters then become citizens, that the argument was engaging in the political system uh, and exercising rights in the electoral arena ultimately spills over to other arenas. So that's what uh, really what I'm trying to look at in this data is, are there, is there evidence in the, at the micro level, taking into account macro level impacts um, of positive externalities of citizens' evaluations of their election? Uh, do citizens who think their elections are free and fair more likely to do a range of, of, in, of interesting things? And those things are, uh, well, sorry, just uh, we, we, the analysis starts off by saying on what basis do ordinary Africans assess the integrity of their elections? So is it simply having a, a more uninterrupted elections or is it the actual quality of the election? Which one of those matters more? Does whether losers accept the election matter uh, as well as looking at individual level uh, associations of cognitive sophistication and people's levels of uh, people's partisanship, specifically whether they're support winning or losing parties. And then the analysis then turns around and says, well, once we've figured that out, how do electoral evaluations translate into larger attitudes toward the political system, the democratic system, looking at systems performance, both at the level of the regime, as well as the institutions, the responsiveness of the elected leaders, but as well as looking at the legitimacy side, the demand side, uh, looking at support for the democratic regime, uh, the legitimacy of the constitution and legitimacy of law enforcement institutions. And lastly, I try and look at whether these added, whether the evaluations of the institution of the election uh, translate in any meaningful way into higher levels of behavior, looking at community, communing, meaning uh, getting involved in community politics, contacting uh, elected officials, protesting, and attitudes about the, the use of violence. Uh, we don't actually have uh, questions about the use of violence. In some Afro-Brahma circles, we do have that. So as a proxy, I've simply used uh, support for the idea of whether violence can ever be legitimately used in, in politics. So this is the first set of analysis that the paper really looks at is, is what are the determinants of electoral evaluations? And then we move on basically then to look at how electoral evaluations translate into system legitimacy, systems performance, and then looking into community contacting and protesting. Now, just two caveats at this point. This is, a, a, again, a first draft of the paper. And right now we use simple ordinary least squared regression analysis in a, in, in a series of, of analyses. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the ideal way to do this is to look at hierarchical lineal modeling. So it enables us to look at both the separate effects more accurately of macro and micro level um, uh, effects. And that'll be done in the, in the final version of the paper. But also, I hope to be able to look at this entire analysis through path, path modeling to, to actually, in a sense, follow the electoral money, money as it will, to try and follow whether there is an identifiable 
uh, flow from the left-hand side of that model over to the right-hand side. Uh, again, that'll be hopefully in, in a subsequent version of the paper. Now, uh, um, I don't know whether people can see this. Yeah, I'll say it's now up on your board. I don't know whether people can see this or not. Uh, I've got some um, a verbal a summary of this in, in, in a few slides, but just to um, call attention to the fact that uh, you know, I've got to move the, your picture so I can see what I'm looking at. I'm looking at. Hang on. I can't see my slide because of your picture, so I'm going to look at the actual hard copy in front of me. This was a, a, a series of analysis simply looking at whether people base their evaluation of the election on the objective quality of the election as judged by international observers and coded in the Lindbergh data set. And while on its own, uh, versus uh, the, Lind the, the Lindbergh argument of, of repeated elections, and you see in Model 1, the expert ratings of elections by international observers is clearly far more important determinant than consecutive elections, which actually have no effect, effect uh, at all. But then when we look at uh, we added in uh, media, um, media use, education, uh, and uh, partisan uh, factors, as well as look at the interactions, I, Model 3 adds in a series of interactions. We'll just look at Model 3 right now. And it shows that the most important factor is still the objective quality of the election, uh, whether the election is rated on a free on a four point scale as free or fair or not free and fair. Uh, but uh, we also see that cognitive sophistication matters a lot. People who use the news media, uh, people who are educated are more critical of the elections. Um, winners are much more uh, uh, positive toward the election. Losers, people who support losing parties are more critical. But I think what's also interesting are the interactions. Uh, I tested a, a range of them. Two of them became, uh, were significant. Uh, basically, if you support a losing party in a country in which losing parties reject the election, that had an important additional negative impact. And media use in general, the main effect has no, no uh, uh, effect. But in countries which had flawed elections, media use became uh, people who use the media, which much more critical of their electoral of the freeness and fairness of their election. Um, and I'll go through the next two slides. They're in the paper. I'll go through them a little more quickly. But just to note, then looking at explaining perceptions of the output of the democratic system, there's a very, very strong effect. Uh, uh, it's generally weak across the other um, dependent variables, across trust in police and courts, or um, responsiveness of the elected officials. But there's a very, very strong impact of the perceived freeness and fairness of elections on the perceived supply of democracy. Again, meaning those people are people who are both satisfied with the way democracy works and people who think that the country they live in is indeed democratic. And as might be expected, the perceived freeness also has a very strong impact on trust in the electoral commission. And then turning around and looking at the legitimacy, the effects are, are, are far weaker. Very modest effects at best. There is some impact uh, evidence of the Lindbergh argument on uh, on democratic legitimacy, that uh, countries in which uh, have had longer runs of consecutive unbroken elections, uh, people there are much more likely to prefer democracy and reject authoritarian rule. But otherwise, the, the, the impacts are, are quite modest. And looking at citizen behavior, the only really interesting results, and some of them are, are inconsistent uh, with what we might expect, it, are in terms of, of people's view of the, of the role of violence in politics. Uh, where losing parties reject the elections, people are much more likely to support the use of violence in, elect, uh, in politics. Uh, although, interestingly, the expert rating where elections are guard, regarded as free and fair, um, I think that's somewhat of a statistical artifact that has actually a bivariate, no bivariate relationship. But once we take into account whether losing parties re reject uh, good elections, also seem to increase the rule of law. But that's uh, uh, that needs to be investigated. It's a uh, so quite an unanticipated effect. Uh, but also, where people think the election is free and fair, they're uh, less likely to um, uh, support the, uh, the use of violence. But again, the effects are, are relatively modest. Now, putting these together more in, in just more uh, verbal terms, in terms of the characteristics of elections, most impacts of repeated elections, meaning the Lindbergh argument, are modest at best. Uh, and often inconsistent or, or simply negligible. 
objectively free and fair elections are associated with higher levels of trust in the Electoral Commission and higher levels of perceived supply of democracy. But again, the effects are quite modest. Opposition party rejection of the results are associated with increased support for political violence, though surprisingly lower levels of protests. Now, the, the impact, as we've seen, the, the results are much stronger in terms of perceptions of freeness of fairness. We've now seen that perceptions of freeness are based on the actual integrity of that election, though both cognitive sophistication and partisanship help shape these evaluations uh, in important ways. But in turn, perceptions of the freeness and fairness have some effects on decreasing support for violence, increasing the legitimacy of the Constitution, and increasing the trustworthiness of the Electoral Commission and of the police and the courts. But most importantly, it's very, very strongly related to increasing the perceived supply of democracy. And I think, at least as the paper stands now, that is the most important theoretical payoff because, and I just want to make one connection to some, some parallel work we've been doing on the Afrobarometer. Uh, I think we can argue that perceptions of electoral in integrity are integral parts of the balance between democratic demand and democratic supply, or what Pippa Norris in her a recent book is called The Democratic Deficits, at least in some countries. And I just want to take another minute or so to, uh, to, to make this argument. Uh, what you have in front of you right now is just an argument that we've been developing in, 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 in a series of publications on the Africa Brummer that the argument that is one way to think about democratic consolidation is, in, is where you have both very high levels of popular demand for democracy, meaning people who think democracy is always preferable and reject three forms of authoritarianism, and the perceived supply of democracy, and again, which is being satisfied with democracy and thinking you live in a democracy. And the argument is that somewhere up in the upper right-hand corner of that uh, chart is democratic nirvana, where consolidated democracies live, and we would expect to see countries in that zone and remain there over several different surveys. But also in Africa, we can there's a strong possibility that you can have hybrid regimes consolidate, where in a sense there's a there's a, a roughly equal balance of people who want democracy uh, and think they're living in it uh, in a democracy, but at relatively low levels, so that there's a kind of a stasis around a hybrid regime. Now, I just want to actually show how some countries uh, in, two, in round four in 2008, here's where countries uh, allocated themselves on this supply uh, demand curve. And uh, interestingly, there are no countries in the upper right hand corner that we can term consolidated democracies. Uh, there are su surprises. Lesotho uh, is rated by Freedom House as a, as a as a elite electoral democracy, but the, the Basutu don't think they're living in a democracy and don't really much want one. Um, but let's look at how these um, countries spread themselves out over a range of surveys, over four surveys. Now, when we do that, it looks a bit like a snow blizzard. It doesn't appear to make a whole lot of sense until we start separating them out based on where these countries repeatedly fall uh, in certain zones. So we can, for example, see a series of hybrid regimes in Benin, Cabo Verde, Malawi, Mali, Senegal, in which the demand and the supply for democracy is at about mid, fair to middling levels uh, over a series of surveys. And you can see them there. And I just quickly want to get to where I'm going, but just to show you these in contrast. Uh, there are, Ghana and Botswana could be called, called consolidating democracies because those countries have been moving upwards up the diagonal over time. And indeed, I think in the very last round five results, Ghana is, is now crept into the consolidation zone. There's also a series of countries at low demand, low supply levels, such as Burkina Faso, Lesotho, and Madagascar. Uh, and before we get to the final payoff, just interestingly, there's, there's a series of countries, uh, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, which habitually, over all four surveys, the supply of democracy is higher than the demand, people getting more democracy than what they want. But I think the interesting connection to the results that we've just looked at are with these sets of countries. This is where demand outstrips supply, or in a sense of what Pippa would have called countries that are experiencing de a democratic deficit. Uh, it's Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and clearly what all these, beside other things, what these countries have all in common compared to other countries is uh, repeated flawed elections. Uh, now, flawed elections in a place like uh, Lesotho or Madagascar may not be so uh, uh, problematic 
because there's not a high level of demand for democracy. But these are countries in which there are, are quite considerable shares of Democrats who want the country to become more democratic. And, uh, you know, I think putting these two things together, there's, you know, this is can show the macro level uh, echoes of the micro level findings we've just reviewed, that there's a whole series of, there's a these series of four countries in which demand outstrips supply, they've all, and it's mostly because of, of having repeated flawed elections. And these are all countries that exper have experienced over time levels of political stability and some of them having significant levels of political violence. And that just leads then to some, uh, back to some conclusions or tentative conclusions. So at least with regard to citizenship, elections do matter in some ways. Uh, quality seems to matter much more than simple repetition of elections. Uh, and I think what this means in the, in the grand scale of things is, especially from a donor perspective, is doing relatively simple things like just convening a free and fair election. Now, Again, that's not that simple, but compared to hard things, mm -hmm. such as transforming economies or delivering services to all citizens, they're relatively easy. And in, in, in many instances, they can have disproportionately large payoffs simply by getting elections to run right. Uh, we have some evidence in round five uh, where countries that have had previously low levels of supply have gotten their elections right, uh, such as Malawi, such as Zambia, the elections have worked right. And perceptions of supply of democracy have increased quite dramatically. Uh, so I think all this means is that donors need to maintain their focus on election assistance and monitoring in Africa. Uh, and if they want to move into other areas like legislatures and political parties, they, they, they simply can't do it at the expense of moving out of the electoral arena in which actually unfortunately has happened in, in, in several countries in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, and really um, excellent in terms of mixing up the macro and the micro. And you can still stay with us for the questions and for the further discussion? Yes. Marvellous.